Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. And it is not that uh, types of uh, geometry is alone. There is something called dislocation loops, which is more uh, realistic. And uh, suppose if you see that uh, a crystal contains a dislocation loop like this, how do we understand this? Suppose this is a glide plane. Glide plane we know now where the dislocation moves easily. So this is a shear stress direction. And suppose this is a loop. And then how do we understand this Burgers vector here? The Burgers vector is marked like this. So at least one point you can think of. Since we know the Burgers vector's orientation with respect to dislocation line, we will be able to clearly say that, okay, suppose if it is parallel to this, this could be a screw character. And if it is perpendicular to this, B could be an edge character. And in between, we know the mixed character. So that is how we should understand this loop. Okay. Suppose if we, the, the, the completely, you know, the, the loop is generated inside this crystal like this, crystal unit. Once this, uh, the unit, the, the dislocation loop comes out of this unit cell, then it will leave the um, slip line like this, a slip region in the crystal like this. Of course, that is a glide plane. So a dislocation loop and an offset produced by action of shear stress tau upon loops, what is shown here. Okay. See, the other schematic what is shown here will give you much more, uh, again, clarity in terms of, you know, suppose you imagine that uh, a huge uh, chunk of a crystal unit has been taken out from the uh, larger crystal, something similar to this, uh, which, has, which has got a dislocation loop in it. And how do we understand this loop with respect to the screw and edge character? That is what is shown here. It's the same idea, but as we, as we have done with the previous slides, like we have taken some extra uh, schematic to describe and get more clarity. Similarly, we can do that here. So what is shown here, this is a slip region inside the a crystal unit. And this is the cutout unit from there, which is already slipped, which is exhibiting a screw character as well as edge character and somewhere in between a mixed character that we know what to do, right? So now what is shown here is, the loop in the opposite uh, ends will have the dislocations of opposite sign. That is one important character. So I just mentioned here, it's about whether it is a screw or edge with respect to B orientation. That's what I just mentioned. But within that uh, edge dislocation, if these opposite sides will have opposite signs. Okay, so this is positive edge dislocation, this is negative edge dislocation. So similarly, this is positive screw dislocation, this is negative screw dislocation. And we have to make sure that, okay, in a in a, in terms of, you know, geometrical understanding, you just look at this, uh, the clockwise uh, burger circuit, which, uh, shows the Burgers vector B, right? B is here. This is a B. And the same, it should be the same Burgers vector in the other side also. Okay. Even if you do it in a anti-clockwise, the Burgers vectors of both these sides should be similar. So these are some of the uh, simple points, but uh, important points you have to remember. If you want to keep the track of uh, dislocation line, orientation, bulk inspector, and so on. Okay, so that is about the dislocation loop description. So now let us spend some time on Burger Spectres. Okay, 
which is uh, also very important. How do we mock this circuit? So this is the a lattice which has got an, uh, a dislocation. Uh, extra half plane is inserted here. Then I have the dislocation core here, which is marked by this. And here it is positive dislocation. If it is inverse symbol of this, it will be a negative. The dislocation uh, line is perpendicular to this, which is going inside the, I mean, perpendicular to this plane. So how do we mark and what is the rule for this uh, making a circuit? Dislocations are characterized by Berger's vector. Consider an atom to atom circuit in the figure that would close on itself if made in a perfect crystal. Suppose uh, you start counting, suppose you leave this code first line and go to the second line, start counting the displacement 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. One, two, three, four. That's it. And then this particular gap, it is failing to close. So that means this is the, uh, that is a defect, right? That is a measure of defect, which is uh, here it is a Berger's vector or failure gap, you can whatever you may call it. So wherever, if, the, if you do it the same thing in a perfect crystal, it will close. So, if it is around the dislocation, it will not close. Yeah. The closure failure is the Berger's vector denoted by B. The Berger's vector can be considered a slip vector because its direction is the slip direction and its magnitude is the magnitude of slip displacement caused by its movement of the dislocation. So, this is very important because uh, Berger, Berger's vector describes the, you know, the slip direction as well as its magnitude of slip displace, displacement. That is why it is very important. A dislocation may wander through a crystal with its orientation changing from place to place, but its Berger's vector is the same everywhere. This is uh, something you have to remember. This is exactly we have just shown in the previous slide, whether it is, uh, you know, looking at in a, a cutout crystal block, we have measured the B, but that is same everywhere, whether you measure it clockwise, anti-clockwise, whether, whether you measure in a screw dislocation side or edge dislocation side or a mixed dislocation side, the magnitude is same. Okay. If the dislocation branches into two dislocations, the sum of the Berger's vectors of the branches equal equals its Berger's vector. So this point we will just uh, we can qualify after a few uh, slides, we will look at it uh, later. So, there is a simple notation system for describing the magnitude and direction of Berger's vector of a dislocation. The direction is indicated by the direction indices and the magnitude by a scalar preceding the direction. So, how to give a kind of a notation system? Okay, so this is a kind of notation system. For example, if the B is given like this, A by 3 times 2 bar 1, 1 direction in a cubic crystal means that the Burgers has a components of 2A by 3 minus A by 3 and a by 3 along the 100, 010 and 001 directions respectively, where a is the lattice parameter. Very important. Don't get confused with this uh, symbolism. a you know lattice parameter and uh, 
you know how to mark a direction in a crystal so planes and uh, you know miller indices we have we would have seen it right so it is the same thing so direction and the magnitude is given okay so all the burgers vectors will have this kind of notation how much uh, magnitude in terms of the lattice parameter and what is the direction its magnitude is uh, mod b so which is uh, you can square and uh, square root of this the direction components in this case it is a square root a times square root of 6 by 3 a dislocation in an fcc crystal corresponding to full slip displacement that restores the lattice would have the burgers vector a by 2 uh, in 110 direction in this case the magnitude is a times square root of 2 by 2 suppose what is, what is shown what is mentioned in this point is suppose in an fcc crystal has got a slip displacement it has slipped to restore that slip region then the burger vector has to move this this amount in this direction okay that's what it says okay how do we see this dislocations okay dislocations are visible in transmission light on microplates okay so what you are seeing here is a bright field uh, transmission light on micrograph uh, typically the dislocations are uh, vis visualized in this manner with a dark contrast uh, what it exhibits okay. dark lines okay this is how it it looks like at least uh, if you want to get into hawaii appearing dark and uh, how you are seeing this is a loop and other things it requires much more uh, knowledge of uh, microscopy and uh, diffraction contrast theory and so on probably you can just uh, take a help of some characterization course to get into the details but this is just an example how it in reality what what do you see how do you see because we just said that edge screw and loop and uh, this doesn't give that kind of a feeling it, it it gives much more chaotic right so uh, to get into this kind of suppose if I, if you want to analyze some of this uh, lines like you know uh, whether it is a loop or suppose whether it is a edge character or screw character and this requires a further analysis but you it can be done okay that is a different uh, uh, field itself analysis of a dislocation in tem okay so for time being it just you know the the message here is we can visualize a dislocation in a tem to understand their uh, behavior and or i mean at least look at their uh, morphology density how much uh, where it is formed is whether it is formed near uh, grain boundaries whether it is formed near any second phase particles or interface boundaries it's very useful at least right whether you involve yourself in analysis of this location that's a, a different question but at least we are able to see them okay let us summarize this uh, geometry of dislocation they are line defects they are one dimensional defects around which atoms are misaligned a dislocation may be considered to have in general two components edge component and a screw component the geometry of the lattice irregularities described by these two components which may be treated as two simple kinds of dislocations shown in the figure and one property of dislocation is its burgers vector b which describes both the magnitude and the direction of the slip 
The burger selector of a pure edge dislocation is perpendicular to the dislocation line. That of the pure dislocation is parallel to the dislocation line. And the burger selector of the hybrid dislocation makes an angle with the dislocation line. When three dislocations meet at a point called node in a crystal, the sum of their bulk vectors is B1 plus B2 plus B3 is equal to 0. So, this particular point we will see it as we move along. To, in, a, in a nutshell, this is a complete description of at least the geometrical nature of this dislocation, how they look like. Okay. So, now we can move on to the next topic. Energy of dislocation. Why are we bothered about this energy of dislocation? Okay. Dislocations are not thermodynamically stable. Their presence always increases the free energy of this crystal. So now we are giving more information. The presence of dislocation increases the free energy of the crystal. Consideration of the energy of the dislocations can be used to explain the following. Why moving a dislocation requires a lower stress than moving a whole atom plane the same distance? Why crystalline material becomes harder with increasing strength? Okay. So this is the first two questions are quite relevant to what we have just seen, right? The theoretical estimation of, you know, bond strength, okay, which is very high. And suppose if we say that, you know, dislocation uh, is responsible for, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, observing the lower strength and so on. But unless we understand the energy of dislocation itself, uh, we cannot explain the other concept, right? So that's why understanding of energy is important. And again, uh, why crystalline material becomes harder with increasing strain? Increasing strain means we are multiplying the dislocation in this crystal system. And multiplying crystals, multiplying the dislocation in the crystal system, it will do so many other things, and the system will become complicated, and uh, the energy always going to get increased. So that's why we are thinking about the energy. Why annealing and recrystallization soften the material? Okay. So increasing the strain increases the dislocation. It gives a clue, right? Increasing the strain increases the dislocation density. Annealing and recrystallization is going to reduce them. It's a kind of, but we don't know. Why low angle grain boundaries form? And are reasonably stable. See, the first statement we say that dislocations are not thermodynamically stable, but here we say that even, even though it is classified thermodynamically not stable, in certain geometry positions in a real time crystals, a, a typical low angle grain boundaries formed by these defects, we will see them how it forms and why it forms and so on. And the energy concept really helps there. And why dispersion and precipitation hardening raise the yield strength, yield stress of crystals? This is another important uh, aspect, uh, very useful in uh, you know, strengthening mechanisms or real-time material development and heat treatment and so on. The dispersion and precipitation hardening has got a close connection with the dislocation and its energy. And finally, why dislocations in FCC crystals break up into two, I mean, into partial dislocations and why edge pits indicate the presence of dislocations. So, we, we will see in the future slides and this location can get dissociated into uh, two dislocations. Right? So why it happens? That also will be addressed in terms of energy. 
energy conservation. Okay. So you see, uh, several questions uh, can be nicely addressed by the dislocation and its energy. Okay. So we will slowly get into this. Okay, I just want to tell you, uh, since I am just flipping the slides, I am going, uh, you know, it may, I may go very fast. In normal circumstances, when we do with, uh, I mean, uh, a blackboard and a chalk, the information and, uh, you know, what it transmits to you and what, how much you absorb will be much slower. Since it's a PPT mode, it may look all, you know, going very fast and and if you don't be conscious of this factor you will also get uh, you know all this concepts will get evaporated from your mind so fast so do pay attention to this aspect it is ppt presentation is not a really a good way of teaching and uh, and at least, you know, the this uh, situation, online teaching more, this is one constraint. So stop everywhere and then don't, don't go very fast. You know, go slow and then think about it and then slowly prepare your personal notes and then try to learn. And you can always interact with us. If you have any doubts okay so now we are going to look at the estimation of energy of a dislocation so what what do we do to estimate the energy of a dislocation we can consider a cylindrical crystal of length l with the screw dislocation of Burgers vectors b along its axis so we are going to consider this kind of a geometry so this is a cylinder, cylindrical crystal, and uh, this is the screw dislocation, as I just demonstrated in the previous slide. The burger sector is B here. The radius of the cylinder is R. The radius, I mean, the length is L. And what is shown here is just if you open this cylinder. It will be like this. It will be a sheet like this. And this particular geometry is uh, very familiar to you. What is this? We described in the beginning, I mean, some of our previous chapters, it's a shear displacement, right? The shear displacement. So, what is that we are going to see? B and 2 pi r. That is because of the cylindrical geometry and this is the L. So the elastic shear strain gamma in this in a thin annular section of radius R and the thickness dr is gamma is equal to B by 2 pi R. So now you have enough background to understand this simple calculation of a shear strain gamma and how it comes right. So we don't have to spend more time on this now. And where B is a the Burger sector here, but we are interested in the magnitude. So what we are interested in, we are interested in the energy per unit volume, that is dE by dV of the thin annular region is then given by dE by dV is equal to half tau gamma. This expression also quite familiar to you. We may not have used exactly dE by dV, but then you see that you know half tau gamma. If you go back to the initial elasticity theory, we have seen all this. Okay. So gamma, you substitute that whatever we have seen earlier, then you get this expression d by d v, right? Where g is the elastic shear modulus, the volume of the annular ring is d v is equal to two pi r l dr. And you can write d e is equal to l g b square by 4 pi times dr by r. Okay. 
the strain energy resulting from the presence of this dislocation may be computed by integrating from some lower limit r naught to some upper limit r you see we are looking at the a uh, cylindrical annular system right so but we have not fixed the r so to calculate the strain energy resulting from this kind of a dislocation the r can be varied from r not to capital r so that is the idea so for that we are going to integrate this expression that is e is equal to integral integral over r not to capital r l g b square by 4 pi times dr by dr so dr by r which is equal to l g b square by 4 pi ln r by capital r by small r plus e not so this is a simple integration if the limits of either r dot is equal to 0 or r is equal to infinity are chosen the integral is infinite which is clearly unrealistic so either you cannot i mean either you choose r not or r as a zero then the integral becomes unrealistic okay the difficulty with choosing r not is equal to 0 is that hooke's law is not valid for the high strain at the dislocation core okay very important point we have reached okay the very reason i have just moved to this topic of dislocation before going to anything else is the energy system and the stress field around the dislocation everything is dealt with elasticity theory since we have just looked at all the concepts or brushed up all the elasticity theory i thought it be very easy to just to describe the dislocation before you uh, forget everything in total okay so the whole uh, stress field around dislocations are explained by elasticity theory only okay so the if you take r not is equal to 0 then the hooke's law is not going to be valid okay because of the very high strain at the core because we are talking about elastic behavior so the core of the dislocation need not be a need not follow the elastic uh, elasticity theory concepts that's the idea the value capital r is r is equal to infinity is also unrealistic because at large values of strain field of the dislocation is cancelled by those of the other dislocations we are going to qualify all these statements uh, one by one so it has been shown that if r not is taken as b the real strain energy inside the core e not is only a small fraction of total energy and can be neglected since the energy is relatively insensitive to r by r the ratio used is usually ln capital r by r not which is equal to 4 pi within the limits of the approximations made then the energy of the screw dislocation is given as e is equal to approximately equal to l g b square so finally we we with all the assumptions we got one expression of energy of a screw dislocation e is equal to l g b square so g is a constant l is geometry anyway so what is the message the energy is proportional to square of the burgers vector this you have to remember that is what we have we have shown in the beginning but this is what we have finally arrived at also so what i am now showing here is two schematic one is uh, edge dislocation and the screw dislocation and what is shown there is a shadow behind right the behind this three dimensional schematic there is a shadow the kind of try to show the stress field around this dislocation 
the energy of a dislocation energy dislocation is given by approximately by e is equal to 1 by 1 minus mu times l g b square by 4 pi ln r by r naught plus e naught which is equal to l g b square by 1 minus mu see all of you now must get alerted the moment you change from screw dislocation to edge dislocation the modulus part is changing to not just g it is g by 1 minus u so you just recall we have derived this where where do you get 1 minus u term in elasticity theory we have derived lot of small small derivations right especially in the elastic stress strain relations if you go back and see we have just derived this uh, 1 minus u term where does it come you look at what is the modulus given for plane stress problem and a plane strain problem okay very important so the moment you go to the plane strain uh, problem then this kind of uh, 1 minus u terms comes in a elasticity theory. So something like that. We are not getting into the details, but I am just giving you a clue. Right? So when you move from screw dislocation to edge dislocation expressions, you will always see that this 1 by 1 minus u term comes in the edge dislocation. Okay. So you can just imagine that, you know, how it would have got inserted. That is because you are now considering the state of stress as a plane problem especially a plane strain problem then the 1 minus new term comes so if you understand all these subtle differences then you don't have to worry about all these mathematical terms it's very very easy to uh, look at it where the mu is the poisson's ratio if mu is uh, 1 by 3 the energy of its dislocation is about 3 by to that of the two dislocation of the same line. <coughs> Since the energy of the edge and screw dislocation is proportional to B square, the most stable dislocations are those with the minimum Burgers vector, which is those in the close pack direction. So this is very important uh, information again. Okay. It is talking about stability. Most stable dislocations are those with a minimum Burgers vector. The equations above also show that the energy of a dislocation is proportional to its length. Yes. E, e is equal to L times GB square. That is what we have seen. Right. So just as the surface energy is equivalent to surface tension, a line energy is equivalent to line tension. This is kind of uh, analogy. Okay. Thus, a curved dislocation will have a line tension T, a vector acting along the line. So, we can write it like this. T is equal to rate of change of energy or change of energy per unit length is equal to GB square. Line tension. We will use this term when we talk about dislocation interactions and dislocation interact with obstacles, these concepts will go a long way when we discuss about strengthening mechanisms and so on. Okay. So it is good that we get familiar with all these terms right at the beginning. The line tension. So this is a stress field uh, uh, behind this uh, uh, two dislocations. Again, when you talk about stress, now we have, so far we have just seen the energy of dislocations. Now we are going to move on to stress fields, which is again uh, very interesting and it will be very, uh, you know, you will be very happy to see that most of the expression you would have, you are already familiar with, right? Because they are all treated by elasticity theory. So I think we will stop here and uh, we'll move on. Uh, to the next topic in the next class. Thank you.